In our last video lecture, we saw the rise and fall of the Nixon presidency. Um, we saw Richard Nixon elected in 1968, which was a coup of sorts, considering it was really the first time in over 30 years that the Republican Party had been able to stand on an equal footing with the Democratic Party. Um, and in 1972, we saw him re-elected by an overwhelming landslide, only to be undone by an issue known as Watergate, um, the, uh, the obsession with the Vietnam War, uh, if you will, is, is ultimately going to lead to his demise. And one thing that we actually did not talk about would be the guy that's going to take over for Nixon when he resigned the office of the presidency. And that is the man that you're looking at if you're following along on a PowerPoint with me there. That's Jerry Ford, um, uh, uh, the vice president that was placed on Richard Nixon's ticket in 1972. You have to understand how big of a deal Watergate was and Richard Nixon's uh, resignation in the context of all of that. We're not talking about just an impeachable offense. We're, we're talking about the crime, an actual crime of obstruction of justice. And you have to understand that what Watergate basically was saying that was nobody, including the president of the United States, was above the law. And so therefore, Richard Nixon very well might have his day in court. And and and, and very well, if convicted, there's very strong evidence that um, you know he, he did know about these. Um, if convicted, the president of the United States could very well be doing prison time. One of the first acts of Ford is going to be to pardon Richard Nixon, okay? This is a really, really big deal. And it's very easy for us to sit back from the vantage point of the 21st century and, and give uh, Jerry Ford a pass on this. Uh, that what we really needed was to come back together. We, we needed healing. There were all of these things that were exploding all around us. Civil rights, um, Vietnam, the, the polarization of American politics. And you can see why he might feel like the best way forward would be to just give Richard Nixon a pardon and put this whole Watergate business beh behind us. At the time... That was a really dramatic thing to do. There were people that were very angry as to what Richard Nixon was up to, and they very much wanted to see him have his day in court. And so Jerry Ford's going to take an awful lot of heat for doing this. Um, you, I don't know that it would be fair to say that this is Ford and consequently the Republicans basically committing political suicide, but it's pretty close, okay? Um, you would also think that the Democrats, uh, this would be a tailor-made opportunity for them to kind of um, lick their wounds and reorganize, um, sort of refresh, refashion their brand and come roaring back. But um, keep in mind that the Democratic Party is basically void of leadership. Lyndon Johnson, by, by this point in time, is dead. and He had, he, he had pretty much resigned uh, politics from his life anyway. Robert F. Kennedy is gone. Um, Hubert Humphrey had been uh, defe defeated in 1968. He's sort of in the rearview mirror. They don't really have a lot of leadership left, okay? And so I don't want you to, under to get the idea that the 1970s are, are, are really sort of void of anything really important happening. In many, many ways, we continue to see these culture wars erupt, and they will bleed into American politics, as you'll find out by the end of today's lecture. And I want to begin with um, the continuation of the women's rights movement. In this class, we have seen the movement to empower women uh, kind of ebb and flow, okay? Uh, there are times when it gets very powerful and then it sort of recedes, and then it gets very powerful again and then it recedes. And then in the 1960s, um, you begin to see it sort of on the upswing again. The reason being is a lot of your most staunchest supporters of civil rights happen to be women who began to ask themselves, you know, here I am pounding the pavement for other people's civil rights and who's pounding the pavement for mine, right? In many ways, what will come to be known as the women's liberation movement is going to be an outgrowth of the civil rights movement. And nobody exemplified that mindset better than the lady that you're looking at on the screen right there, well, a feminist by the name of Betty Friedan. We've talked about her 1962 book, The Feminine Mystique. 
which kind of outlined this idea that had emerged in the mid 20th century that uh, you know we say that women can do anything, that women have as much opportunity as men, but very clearly there is a glass ceiling. And there are certain professions, there are certain realms of American life, public and private, that are simply off limits to women. Betty Friedan is going to be a very formidable force in this feminist movement in the 1970s, and she's also going to be a very important um, 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 establisher, uh, founder, if you will, of what comes to be known as the National Organization for Women, or NOW. What NOW is going to do is basically take on um, institutionalized sexism, issues affecting women very, very directly. I'm not simply talking about um, realms of American life that were closed to women based on their sex, although certainly they took on that as well, but issues that were applicable to American women, generally speaking. If you follow the National Football League, you'll know that uh, now has been instrumental in forcing the commissioner and the NFL, generally speaking, to, uh, to enforce its zero-tolerance policy with respect to violence against women. And so this is really going to be instrumental when it comes to the, the formation of, of another issue that we've talked about in this class, the Equal Rights Amendment. All the way back in 1923, there was this initiative to write down in the Constitution that men and women were equal as far as the American law was concerned. And I told you at the time that part of the reason that that doesn't really ever see the light of day was progressive women that were worried that the laws that they had worked very hard to establish, like Mueller versus Oregon, they were laws that were designed to protect American women, um, those laws would be thrown out if, if, if now the law is recognizing men and women as exactly equal. In the 1970s, especially the early 1970s, we begin to see ERA come back in American politics again. And, um, you know, in the aftermath of the Civil Rights Movement, when you've got a Civil Rights Act and a Voting Rights Act, and people agree that there is no difference as far as uh, the equal protection of the law, as far as race is concerned, a lot of people are on the same page when it comes to sex, and that we ought to write this down in the Constitution. And all the ERA basically said was states would not be allowed to deny equal protection to um, any American citizen based exclusively on sex alone. And so basically what this is doing is it's giving equal protection under the law to American women, um, in theory opening up various realms of American life that have heretofore been closed to them. Um, relatively vanilla in the way of uh, its radicalism, at least it seems, um, but uh, there's, there's going to be more to it than that, as you're going to find out. And, and once again, you're going to see some pretty unlikely opponents that are going to stand up and try to stop the emergence of ERA. Getting organizations like NOW off the ground and getting you know laws like ERA on the books in the end is going to involve changing culture with respect to gender roles. Okay. We saw an unmistakable return of traditional gender roles in the aftermath of World War II. Okay? I made mention of that in that culture of um, conformity lecture, the affluent society. Part of the big challenge that um, American feminists are going to face when it comes to this is, is changing American culture when it comes to gender norms. And so what you'd see are some of these feminists, and again, if you're following along in the PowerPoint with me, you're, you're taking a look at a couple of them that would crash these Miss America pageants, proclaiming them to be institutionalized forms of sexism. Okay, What they really mean is there's no male equivalent to this. And yes, I know that there are, are you know bodybuilder shows and Mr. Universe and things of that variety, but let's let's be honest, those are, those are really outliers in comparison to what you've got with the way of women. The objectification of the female body, as was being um, exemplified in that, uh, in that photo that you're, that you're viewing along with me, um, that drove right to the point when it comes to there is no male equivalent to all of this. And so grassroots organizing like this, not, not limited to this, but certainly similar to this, is going to be instrumental in a Supreme Court case that will come along in 1973 known as Roe versus Wade. 
I'm trying to be as politically neutral as I possibly can when I explain this. What Roe versus Wade is essentially going to do is legalize the institution that we call abortion. It will legalize abortion as a protected procedure in these United States from 73 forward. Now, I want you to understand that abortions, abortions happened before 1973. They happened before 1963. We don't need to get into this, but just don't, let's understand. They, they were not officially legal, similar to how drinking was taking place in 1924, 1926, and 1928. Um, but it was not legal to, to take a drink of alcohol because the Volstead Act had made that illegal. And so to break that law would, would essentially be to go against the law of the land of the United States. And Roe versus Wade is changing that. From the feminist perspective, this was a game changer because what this would do is it would allow women to have control over their reproductive capabilities. It would allow women to decide what would happen to their bodies. Would they carry the pregnancy to term or not? Would they terminate a pregnancy that uh, was the result of incest, was the result of rape, was the result uh, of, of circumstances simply beyond their control? Would they be allowed to terminate a pregnancy um, if it jeopardized the health of the mother? And so you can see how and why the feminists might see this as an equalizer, that by law they would not be forced to carry a, a fetus to term. Okay, And so from that perspective, feminists are quite happy with this Roe versus Wade decision, that this is, a, this is an equalizer, a game changer in the realm of sexual equality. At the same time, it cannot be said enough how much Roe versus Wade is going to awaken a sleeping giant in American politics. I don't know if you remember me talking about the Scopes Monkey Trial all the way back in 1925, but evangelical Christians were absolutely humiliated in that event uh, the idea of trying to ban the teaching of Darwinian theory in uh, Tennessee classrooms, horribly embarrassed by that, and they simply retreated from American politics. And I said at the time, it's not like they just simply disappeared. They were there. They just were not very overtly political. What issues like Roe versus Wade is doing is they're bringing back conservative Christian voters. I'm saying Christian very broadly defined because certainly... Um, the Catholics, conservative Catholics, had a thing or two to say about the institution of abortion. But generally speaking, what you're seeing here, guys, would be the rise of what is today known as the religious right. What the religious right consists of are socially conservative American voters. Um, I mean conservative Catholics. I mean evangelical Christians. But I also mean people like Mormons, Orthodox Jews, people that... We're, we're, we're deeply suspicious of some of these issues like radical feminism or what they perceive to be as radical feminism, um, the, the turning of upside down of quote-unquote traditional American values when it comes to the uh, man breadwinner, uh, woman bread giver sort of roles, and um, they're, they're beginning to make their way back into politics. The individual that you're seeing on the screen there with a Bible in his hand, um, that is a guy by the name of Jerry Falwell, who is going to start this organization called the Moral Majority. And what he's going to do is he's going to recruit uh, conservative Christians into this political movement, registering them to vote, uh, teaching them up, if you will, on the issues, and uh, basically mobilizing conservative voters uh, at least socially conservative voters, to, to vote, especially on many, many of these issues that might loosely fall into the category that you and I would call culture wars. Um, you're looking at that lady that's holding that, uh, that sign. Um, you know, this whole idea that, you know, these science books, um, even to some extent history books, portray Darwinian theories as accepted fact um, this was deeply offensive to the conservative Christian uh, community, and um, there's an element of the religious right that is going to kind of come across as overtly anti-intellectual. Let's make no mistake about this. Um, the idea of banning the teaching of a, a, an actual academic um, uh, um, 
um, the theory in a classroom like Darwinian thought, that doesn't exactly scream pro-intellectual. And so a lot of these individuals are, are mobilizing against institutions that they see as overtly secular, as being committed to a non-religious society. Of course, that's uh, city dwellers, certainly saw that in the 1920s. It's um, the media, generally speaking, and, and it's especially uh, the, the academy, um, people in colleges and universities that um, are kind of professing these things to be accepted facts. In any case, this religious right political movement is going to be a really big development in, 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 in American politics by the mid-1970s. Um, the guy that you're looking at at the bottom right corner of the screen, uh, it says 700 Club behind him, that would be another one of these evangelical Christians, a guy by the name of Pat Robertson, who is going to establish um, this uh, variety show called the 700 Club, which actually got its start more or less as a Christian charity program where you would have musicians and, uh, you know, magicians and entertainers, generally speaking. They would perform and uh, you, the audience, would call in with donations to Christian charities, okay? But over the course of time, it became sort of like what you think of um, institutions like The Daily Show or Saturday Night Live. It, it, it became, um, you know, the news, but through the lens of uh, Christian politics, similar to how Saturday Night Live's Weekend Update was the news, but through the lens of comedy, okay? Generally speaking, all I really need you to understand about the religious right is you're seeing an unmistak unmistakable reemergence of evangelical Christianity, conservative Christianity, generally speaking, that, that is now deeply immersing itself in American politics. This is a game changer. Okay, because these individuals are going to tend to gravitate toward the political party that is espousing um, what it sees as family values. Okay, and of course, the, the, the political organization that I'm talking about would be the Republican Party. And throughout the late 20th century and into the 21st century, it would continue to be the Republican Party that would portray itself as the party um, where religious ha relig religion had a safe home, and it was the party of family values, okay? Another individual that's kind of floating in between all of this would be a lawyer by the name of Phyllis Schlafly. Schlafly is an unlikely individual, very similar to how Jane Addams was an unlikely individual to, to, to push back against this adoption of the Equal Rights Amendment. Keep in mind that the religious right took aim not only at academics, and not only at Roe versus Wade, but also what they perceived to be as um, anti-family, uh, anti-biblical family teachings and philosophies in American public life. And of course, that was ER, that had ERA written all over it. And what Schlafly is going to do is she's going to stop, start this organization that comes to be known as Stop ERA. This was a collection of housewives that would go knocking on doors, and when, they, uh, when, they, when somebody opened up, they would hand them a hand-baked apple pie. And on the side uh, of the box that had that apple pie inside of it, um, it had a sticker that said, My heart and hand went into this dough for the sake of the family. Please vote no on ERA. Now, in addition to the grassroots mobilizing, which was deeply, deeply effective, um, they also were able to get a hold of media outlets that were pretty content to cover both the pro-ERA side, the feminist side, as well as the stop ERA side almost equally. Okay? And what Schlafly and company began to argue was that ERA, if it was allowed to go through, would create this weird unisex society, a society where women would be drafted into the military, and you'd see these creepy unisex bathrooms. They proclaimed that it would legalize same-sex marriage. It had nothing to do with same-sex marriage. But nonetheless, because they were given this bully pulpit through the media, um, their message was well-received. And the result very similar to the 1920s, is ERA is not going to see the light of day. So we will go through the rest of the 20th century and a very good chunk of the uh, uh, 21st century with no law that basically says woman is man's equal as far as the law 
is concerned in the United States. Stop ERA also demonstrates that the religious right, and, and certainly Schlafly would have been very much considered part of the religious right, uh, was a new major voting bloc in American politics. Think of it this way. The religious right is going to become as much of an important cornerstone to the Republican Party um, by the late 70s as uh, industrial workers and union workers were to the Democratic Party by the end of the 1930s. They're a very, very formidable force. Now, it's not as if people on the left, or liberal side, are just sort of rolling over here. You do see some pretty intense battles continuously emerging. One of the things that Lyndon Johnson said after he was elected president in 1964 is that simply to get the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act on the book, that was, that was just not enough, right? You can't take 300 years of institutionalized oppression and then try to wipe it clean with a law that says now you're equal and you're free to go out there and compete with everybody else. That was not a su sufficient enough. In short, what he was driving at is that certain institutions needed to be opened up to people that had been purposefully and consciously excluded from those opportunities. Talking about things like banking, finance, the ability to get loans. Talking especially about institutions um, of higher learning. Uh, we've seen that in this class before. We've seen institutions of K-12 through variety that have excluded people of color. Also talking about the professions, okay? Um, we know that it's not simply as easy as walking into uh, you know a law firm and saying well, I'm very well qualified and I will work very hard and please hire me. It's not that simple. We know that. Okay. Lyndon Johnson's ideas in this capacity came to be known as what you call affirmative action. Okay. What affirmative action was designed to do was to promote diversity, and that's worth writing down. Okay. The way that it was supposed to work was that if you had two equally qualified candidates, right? Uh, for example, they had similar GPAs, they had similar test scores, they had similar extracurricular activities on their resumes, then at, at that point, if they were both equally qualified, you could take race, ethnicity, religion, um, you know, quote-unquote diversity broadly defined, you could take that into consideration. And so you can see how institutions of higher learning might gravitate toward that because uh, the, the thought that we've always had was, Students learn as much from each other as they as they do from the professor. Okay. The problem with this is going to be it's going to exaggerate white fears and also resentment. The idea being that there's there's going to be advantages. There, there's going to be given opportunity. There's going to be opportunities given to people of color that that are that are not being given to whites. Some would go as far as to call this reverse racism. Part of the way, or part of the reason that that really begins to gain some traction in American life involves the man that you're looking at on the screen right there. That man is a guy from Atlanta by the name of Maynard Jackson, who's going to be elected in the late 70s. He's going to be elected um, mayor. Uh, he's going to be the first African American to be elected mayor of a major southern city, you know, it'd be Atlanta. Now, when he was elected, he was elected on a very uh, pro-civil rights, anti-poverty platform, which is easy to you know, campaign on and, and much more difficult to implement. Okay? Jackson is going to be given this opportunity, a very unique opportunity, in the construction of a state-of-the-art airport in Atlanta. And this would involve millions of jobs, maybe not millions, but definitely tens of thousands of jobs. And when he inherited... In Atlanta's leadership, he inherited not only the poorest, one of the most impoverished cities in the country, but also one of the most densely black con concentrated urban centers anywhere in the country. And so this construction of the airport would be a real opportunity to kind of address the issue of poverty in Atlanta. So what he does, citing this whole idea of affirmative action, is say that he's not going to sign anything. He, he's not going to shovel one scoop full of dirt until 22% uh, of the workforce, broadly defined, 22% consists of people of color and what might loosely be called minorities. Okay. Now, once again, you can see 
but by wanting to write down a number and insist that that number be met, you can see where he's going, that this 22% is going to be a real meaningful uh, uh, figure to those people that have up until this point been excluded to, to jobs and opportunities that would have allowed them to lift themselves out of poverty. You might also be able to see how and why this, this would give some, 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 some fuel to the fire that is this is just an opportunity that's being given to some, but not for all. That this is essentially what was being called reverse racism. Now, I'm not saying that I believe that it's reverse racism, but what I am saying is that this is going to become something that's going to be pretty easy to attack. And you're going to see this idea uh, of a quota system that's involved in affirmative action. You're going to see this attacked again and again and again. It's going to be attacked at the University of Dave, uh, University of California at Davis's Medical Center. You'll see it attacked in the University of Michigan's um, uh, undergraduate entrance policies. Later on, in the early 20th, 21st century, you'll see it attacked at the University of Texas at Austin when it comes to who has what opportunity to enroll there. Okay. And again and again and again, a lot of this comes back to, are you just throwing a quota against the wall and you're, you're willing to allow that many people of that variety entrance in and everyone else is held to a higher standard? Or what exactly does it mean? And the bottom line is, even in the midst of the 21st century, we're still trying to hash out exactly what that means. It's a delicate balancing act and it's not always an exact science. But as you can see, culturally, economically, and politically, the 1970s are a very important time period, and they're going to play a very important role, not only in the rounding out of the 20th century, but also the early 21st century as well. You'll see what I'm talking about here in just a minute.